Mushko Gosha. When a number of people come together, and if these people are harmonized in a certain way, excluding some who make for disharmony, we have what we call an event. This is by no means what is generally understood in contemporary cultures as an event. For them, something which takes place and which impresses people by means of subjective impacts is called an event. This is what some term a lesser event, because it takes place in the lesser world, that of human relationships easily produced, synthesized, commemorated. The real event, of which the lesser event is a useful similitude, not more and no less, is that which belongs to the higher realm. We cannot accurately render a higher event in stilted terrestrial representations and retain accuracy. Something of surpassing importance in a higher realm could not entirely be put in terms of literature, science or drama, without loss of essential value. But certain tales, providing that they contain elements from the high event area which may seem absurd, unlikely, improbable or even defective, can, together with the presence of certain people, communicate to the necessary area of the mind the higher event. Why should it be valuable to do so? Because familiarity with the high event, however produced, enables the individual's mind to operate in a high realm. The tale of Mushkul Gusha is an example. The very lack of completeness in the events, the untidiness of the theme, the absence of certain factors which we have come to expect in a story, these, in this case, are indications of the greater parallel. The Story of Mushkul Gusha Once upon a time, not a thousand miles from here, there lived a poor old woodcutter who was a widower and his little daughter. He used to go every day into the mountains to cut firewood, which he brought home and tied into bundles. Then he used to have breakfast and walk into the nearest town, where he would sell his wood and rest for a time before returning home. One day, when he got home very late, the girl said to him, Father, I sometimes wish that we could have some nicer food and more and different kinds of things to eat. Very well, my child, said the old man. Tomorrow I shall get up much earlier than I usually do. I shall go further into the mountains where there is more wood, and I shall bring back a much larger quantity than usual. I will get home earlier, and I will be able to bundle the wood sooner, and I will go into town and sell it, so that we can have more money, and I shall bring you back all kinds of nice things to eat. The next morning, the woodcutter rose before dawn and went into the mountains. He worked very hard cutting wood and trimming it and made it into a huge bundle which he carried on his back to his little house. When he got home it was still very early. He put his load of wood down and knocked on the door saying, Daughter, daughter, open the door, for I am hungry and thirsty and I need a meal before I go to market. But the door was locked. The woodcutter was so tired that he lay down and was soon fast asleep beside his bundle. The little girl, having forgotten all about their conversation the night before, was fast asleep in bed. When he woke up a few hours later, the sun was high. The woodcutter knocked on the door again and said, Daughter, daughter, come quickly. I must have a little food and go to market to sell the wood, for it is already much later than my usual time of starting. But having forgotten all about the conversation the night before, the little girl had meanwhile got up, tidied the house, and gone out for a walk. She had locked the door, assuming in her forgetfulness that her father was still in the town. 
So the woodcutter thought to himself, It is now rather late to go into the town. I will therefore return to the mountains and cut another bundle of wood, which I will bring home, and tomorrow I will take a double load to market. All that day the old man toiled in the mountains cutting wood and shaping the branches. When he got home with the wood on his shoulders it was evening. He put his burden down behind the house, knocked on the door and said, Daughter, daughter, open the door, for I am tired and I have eaten nothing all day. I have a double bundle of wood which I hope to take to market tomorrow. Tonight I must sleep well so that I will be strong. But there was no answer, for the little girl, when she came home, had felt very sleepy and had made a meal for herself and gone to bed. She had been rather worried at first that her father was not at home, but she decided that he must have arranged to stay in the town overnight. Once again the woodcutter, finding that he could not get into the house, tired, hungry and thirsty, lay down by his bundles of wood and fell fast asleep. He could not keep awake, although he was fearful for what might have happened to the little girl. Now the woodcutter, because he was so cold and hungry and tired, woke very, very early the next morning, before it was even light. He sat up and looked around, but he could not see anything. And then a strange thing happened. The woodcutter thought he heard a voice saying, Hurry, hurry, leave your wood and come this way. If you need enough, and you want little enough, you shall have delicious food. The woodcutter stood up and walked in the direction of the voice. And he walked and he walked, but he found nothing. By now he was colder and hungrier and more tired than ever, and he was lost. He had been full of hope, but that did not seem to have helped him. Now he felt sad, and he wanted to cry. But he realized that crying would not help him either, so he lay down and fell asleep. Quite soon he woke up again. It was too cold, and he was too hungry to sleep. So he decided to tell himself, as if in a story, Everything that had happened to him since his little daughter had first said that she wanted a different kind of food. As soon as he had finished his story, he thought he heard another voice saying, somewhere above him, out of the dawn, Old man, what are you doing sitting there? I am telling myself my own story, said the woodcutter. And what is that? said the voice. The old man repeated his tale. Very well, said the voice. And then the voice told the old woodcutter to close his eyes and to mount, as it were, a step. But I do not see any step, said the old man. Never mind, but do as I say, said the voice. The old man did as he was told. As soon as he had closed his eyes, he found that he was standing up, and as he raised his right foot, he felt that there was something like a step under it. He started to ascend what seemed to be a staircase. Suddenly the whole flight of steps started to move very fast, and the voice said, Do not open your eyes until I tell you to do so. In a very short time, the voice told the old man to open his eyes. When he did, he found that he was in a place which looked rather like a desert, with the sun beating down on him. He was surrounded by masses and masses of pebbles, pebbles of all colours, red, green, blue and white. But he seemed to be alone. He looked all around him and could not see anyone, but the voice started to speak again. Take up as many of these stones as you can, said the voice, then close your eyes and walk down the steps once more. The woodcutter did as he was told, and he found himself, when he opened his eyes again at the voice's bidding, 
standing before the door of his own house. He knocked at the door, and his little daughter answered it. She asked him where he had been, and he told her, although she could hardly understand what he was saying, it all sounded so confusing. They went into the house, and the little girl and her father shared the last food which they had, which was a handful of dried dates. When they had finished, the old man thought that he heard a voice speaking to him again, a voice just like the other one which had told him to climb the stairs. The voice said, Although you may not know it yet, you have been saved by Mushkul Gusha. Remember that Mushkul Gusha is always here. Make sure that every Thursday night you eat some dates and give some to any needy person and tell the story of Mushkul Gusha. Or give a gift in the name of Mushkul Gusha to someone who will help the needy. Make sure that the story of Mushkul Gusha is never, never forgotten. If you do this, and if this is done by those to whom you tell the story, the people who are in real need will always find their way. The woodcutter put all the stones which he had brought back from the desert in a corner of his little house. They looked very much like ordinary stones, and he did not know what to do with them. The next day, he took two enormous bundles of wood to the market and sold them easily for a high price. When he got home, he took his daughter all sorts of delicious kinds of food which she had never tasted before. And when they had eaten it, the old woodcutter said, Now I am going to tell you the story of Mushkul Gusha. Mushkul Gusha is the remover of all difficulties. Our difficulties have been removed through Mushkul Gusha, and we must always remember it. For nearly a week after that, the old man carried on as usual. He went into the mountains, brought back wood, had a meal, took the wood to market and sold it. He always found a buyer without difficulty. Now the next Thursday came and, as is the way of men, the woodcutter forgot to repeat the tale of Mushkul Gusha. Late that evening, in the house of the woodcutter's neighbours, the fire had gone out. The neighbours had nothing with which to relight the fire and they went to the house of the woodcutter. They said, Neighbour, neighbour, please give us a light from those wonderful lamps of yours which we see shining through the window. What lamps? said the woodcutter. Come outside, said the neighbours, and see what we mean. So the woodcutter went outside, and then he saw, sure enough, all kinds of brilliant lights shining through the window from the inside. He went back to the house and saw that the light was streaming from the pile of pebbles which he had put in the corner. But the rays of light were cold and it was not possible to use them to light a fire. So he went out to the neighbours and said, Neighbours, I am sorry I have no fire. And he banged the door in their faces. They were annoyed and confused and went back to their house muttering. They leave our story here. The woodcutter and his daughter quickly covered up the brilliant lights with every piece of cloth they could find, for fear that anyone would see what a treasure they had. The next morning, when they uncovered the stones, they discovered that they were precious, luminous gems. They took the jewels, one by one, to neighbouring towns where they sold them for a huge price. Now the woodcutter decided to build for himself and for his daughter a wonderful palace. They chose a site just opposite the castle of the king of their country. In a very short time, a marvellous building had come into being. Now that particular king had a beautiful daughter, and one day when she got up in the morning, she saw a sort of fairy tale castle just opposite her father's, and she was amazed. She asked her servants, 
Who has built this castle? What right have these people to do such a thing so near to our home? The servants went away and made inquiries, and they came back and told the story, as far as they could collect it, to the princess. The princess called for the little daughter of the woodcutter, for she was very angry with her. But when the two girls met and talked, they soon became fast friends. They started to meet every day, and went to swim and play in the stream which had been made for the princess by her father. A few days after they first met, the princess took off a beautiful and valuable necklace and hung it up on a tree just beside the stream. She forgot to take it down when they came out of the water, and when she got home she thought it must have been lost. The princess thought a little, and then decided that the daughter of the woodcutter had stolen her necklace. So she told her father, and he had the woodcutter arrested. He confiscated the castle and declared forfeit everything that the woodcutter had. The old man was thrown into prison, and the daughter was put into an orphanage. As was the custom in that country, after a period of time the woodcutter was taken from the dungeon and put in the public square, chained to a post, with a sign around his neck. On the sign was written, This is what happens to those who steal from kings. At first people gathered around him and jeered and threw things at him. He was most unhappy. But quite soon, as is the way of men, Everyone became used to the sight of the old man sitting there by his post, and took very little notice of him. Sometimes people threw him scraps of food, sometimes they did not. One day he overheard somebody saying that it was Thursday afternoon. Suddenly the thought came into his mind that it would soon be the evening of Mushkulgusha, the remover of all difficulties and that he had forgotten to commemorate him for so many days. No sooner had this thought come into his head than a charitable man, passing by, threw him a tiny coin. The woodcutter called out, Generous friend, you have given me money which is of no use to me. If, however, your kindness could extend to buying one or two dates and coming and sitting and eating them with me, I would be eternally grateful to you. The other man went and bought a few dates, and they sat and ate them together. When they had finished, the woodcutter told the other man the story of Mushkulgusha. I think you must be mad, said the generous man, but he was a kindly person who himself had many difficulties. When he arrived home after this incident, he found that all his problems had disappeared, and that made him start to think a great deal about Mushkulgusha but he leaves our story here. The very next morning, the princess went back to her bathing place. As she was about to go into the water, she saw what looked like her necklace down at the bottom of the stream. As she was going to dive in to try to get it back, she happened to sneeze. Her head went up, and she saw that what she had thought was the necklace was only its reflection in the water. It was hanging on the bough of the tree where she had left it such a long time before. Taking the necklace down, the princess ran excitedly to her father and told him what had happened. The king gave orders for the woodcutter to be released and given a public apology. The little girl was brought back from the orphanage and everyone lived happily ever after. These are some of the incidents in the story of Mushkulgusha. It is a very long tale, and it is never ended. It has many forms. Some of them are not even called the story of Mushkul Gusha at all, so people do not recognize it. But it is because of Mushkul Gusha that his story, in whatever form, is remembered by somebody, somewhere in the world, day and night, wherever there are people. As his story had always been recited, so it will always continue to be told.
Will you repeat the story of Mushkul Gusha on Thursday nights and help the work of Mushkul Gusha? A hand and a foot do not clap together. Proverb. Cheating Death Once there was a man called Omar, who was a most wealthy merchant. He had a fleet of fine ships, bringing merchandise from far lands. His line was noble, his honour unsullied. One day, his good fortune deserted him. News came that in a fierce storm all his ships had been wrecked, his sailors drowned to a man. Allah have mercy upon me! cried Omar. Surely this is the worst day of my life. But more was to come. Upon returning to his house, he found that it had been burned to the ground, his stocks of silks and jewels gone, his gold taken by thieves. The servants, unable to face him, had run away. He was alone, no money, no home, no personal possessions. Without my treasures I am finished, he thought. I cannot bear to hold up my head among those who respected me for my wealth and position. How in my agony can I start again? It is impossible. And so he decided to take his courage in his hands and cast himself from a high rock into the sea. The angry waters closed over his head and he fell as if into a bottomless pit. But the sea, after half drowning him, cast him up onto the sands. There he lay, blinking up at the sun, in torn and filthy clothes, unable to believe that he was still alive. I only want to die, he cried to the unheeding sky. I can no longer live. He picked himself up and staggered through the rocks upon the beach, thinking of many ways to take his life. In the streets of the town where he wandered, half crazed with despair, no one knew him for the once great merchant that he used to be. He was jostled, pushed out of the way, shouted at by little boys. Suddenly there was an outcry. Death to all kings and rulers! Omar heard the voice of a mad, ragged beggar who was brandishing a knife. He stopped to see what was happening. It was at the gate of the royal palace, where the captain of the guard lay dead, slain by the madman. The soldiers seemed powerless to stop the huge beggar, and Omar ran swiftly to help the king as the shining blade rose again in the insane beggar's hand. Without fear, Omar grappled with the man, and they rolled over and over on the marble floor. The guards rushed into the throne room and severed the man's head from his shoulders. Stop, said the king, as Omar tried to run away, bent on finding some other way to bring about his own destruction. Come here, my good fellow, for I must reward you for saving my life. Your Majesty said Omar. I wish for no reward. I only wish to die. Die? said the king. Why should you die? Tell me all, omitting no detail. My ships have all been wrecked, my house burned, my gold stolen by thieves. I can no longer hold up my head among my associates. Therefore I must find the quickest way to leave this unhappy world. Even the sea refused to drown me. Foolish man, said the king. For saving my life you shall benefit. Is it not forbidden to commit the great sin of taking one's own life? Come, you shall regain all you have lost and become once more high in the land. The king gave instructions to his grand vizier then that Omar was to receive a robe of honour 
new ships were to be fitted out for him regardless of cost, and all his gold restored from the royal treasury. From that hour Omar became once more respected and honoured, and lost the desire to die. In time, he became so wealthy that he was able to ask for the king's daughter in marriage, and amassed a vast fortune in fabulous merchandise. One day, he was walking in the rose garden, smelling one particularly beautiful bloom, when he heard a voice calling his name. He turned and saw a tall figure, with covered face and folded hands, standing under a tree. Peace be upon you, said Omar. Whom have I the pleasure of greeting? I am the angel of death, said the shrouded figure, and I have come to take you to paradise. You must come with me now. Oh, no, no, I cannot come with you, said Omar. I am not ready to go now. I have a fine, rich life, everything I need, the king's daughter for my wife. Please, spare me, let me enjoy the good things of this wonderful world a little longer. You must come with me, said the angel of death. I have my duty just like anyone else. Come, for I must be off to take the call to other men as well. Then Omar thought of a crafty plan. I am not prepared, he said. Let me go to the mosque and say my prayers, and then I will come with you willingly. After you have said your prayers, you will come with me, you promise? asked the angel. Yes, I promise, said Omar, and bent his head to hide a smile. The angel vanished, and Omar laughed aloud. And from that day, Omar never went near a mosque. Years passed, and Omar became more and more important. When his first grey hairs had come, he peered at himself in a looking-glass and thought, How distinguished I have become! Surely I am the most important person in the land after my respected father-in-law the king. A servant entered at that moment to say that the king requested Omar's presence at court before the hour was gone. Omar hastened to listen to what the king had to say. My dear Omar, said the monarch, the religious teacher of the turquoise mosque has died, and I can think of no one more suitable than yourself to take his place. Come, let us go together, this being Friday, and you shall lead the prayer at midday. No, no, your majesty, said Omar in anguish. I, I am not worthy. Please, choose someone else, anyone but me. Your modesty does you credit, said the king. But I am now even more decided that it shall be you. Let us hurry, for it is nearly twelve. Attended by the courtiers, the king and Omar walked towards the turquoise mosque. Although the sun overhead was hot, Omar felt as if an icy hand clutched at his heart. His pride left him, and he knew that the angel of death was not far away. They reached the mosque, and Omar led the congregation in prayer. As the faithful bent their knees and rose and knelt again, Omar prayed more fervently to Allah than he had ever done before. He beseeched the Almighty to forgive his great sins in life and have compassion. After a few moments, the angel of death, with covered head and folded hands, appeared to Omar, unseen by the rest. Come with me now, said the angel. I have waited a long time for you, and this is your day of reckoning. All at once, Omar felt a great peace within his heart. He inclined his head. Very well, he said. It is a great relief, after all, to see you at last. I will go with you. Paradise, after all, is the just reward for all true believers after this life on earth. No, not so, 
said the angel. I am not here to take you to paradise. I came before to do so, but you tricked me, remember, and now you are to be punished. You are to be sent to the lower regions, for you have had your paradise on earth. Before Omar could utter a cry, the angel of death embraced him in his chilly arms and bore him away, leaving upon the marble floor a lifeless figure, clad in a priceless robe, kneeling as if in prayer. A nut has a sweet kernel, a date has a useless stone. Proverb No answer is in itself an answer. Proverb The Three Perceptives There were once three Sufis, so observant and experienced in life that they were known as the Three Perceptives. One day, during their travels, they encountered a camel man, who said, Have you seen my camel? I have lost it. Was it blind in one eye? asked the first perceptive. Yes, said the camel driver. Has it one tooth missing in front? asked the second perceptive. Yes, yes, said the camel driver. Is it lame in one foot? asked the third perceptive. Yes, yes, yes said the camel driver. The three perceptives then told the man to go back along the way they had come and that he might hope to find it. Thinking that they had seen it, the man hurried on his way. But the man did not find his camel and he hastened to catch up with the perceptives, hoping that they would tell him what to do. He found them that evening at a resting place. Has your camel honey on one side and a load of corn on the other? asked the first perceptive. Yes, said the man. Is there a pregnant woman mounted upon it? asked the second perceptive. Yes, yes, said the man. We do not know where it is, said the third perceptive. The camel driver was now convinced that the perceptives had stolen his camel, passenger and all, and he took them to the judge, accusing them of the theft. The judge thought that he had made out a case, and detained the three men in custody on suspicion of theft. A little later, the man found his camel wandering in some fields, and returning to the court, arranged for the perceptives to be released. The judge, who had not given them a chance to explain themselves before, asked how it was that they knew so much about the camel, since they had apparently not even seen it. We saw the footprints of a camel on the road, said the first perceptive. One of the tracks was faint, it must have been lame, said the second perceptive. It had stripped the bushes at only one side of the road, so it must have been blind in one eye, said the third perceptive. The leaves were shredded, which indicated the loss of a tooth, continued the first perceptive. Bees and ants on different sides of the road were swarming over something deposited. We saw that this was honey and corn, said the second perceptive. We found long human hair where someone had stopped and dismounted. It was a woman's, said the third perceptive. Where the person had sat down there were palm prints. We thought from the use of the hands that the woman was probably very pregnant and had to stand up in that way, said the first perceptive. Why did you not apply for your side of the case to be heard so that you could explain yourselves? asked the judge. Because we reckoned that the camel driver would continue looking for his camel and might find it 